We encourage you to ask questions. To do so, look for the question window in the GoToMeeting control panel and type your question. We'll try to answer a few questions at the end, but every question will receive an email response. As I mentioned, my name is Mike Reed. I'm a retired lieutenant with over 31 years of experience and a partner with our company. Lieutenant Paul Bulwer retired after 24 years in law enforcement. During his 15 years of supervisory experience, Paul served in many capacities and was also a certified instructor for the Indiana Law Enforcement Academy. Paul's focus has always been on improving those with whom he served. Among his many accomplishments was coordinating the department's recruit training program and developing a unique school resource officer program with a focus on early intervention. This program received national recognition by the International Association of Chiefs of Police as a model program. Lieutenant Leon Wazalewski retired after 30 years in law enforcement and is a partner in our, in our company as well. Many of his many duties were was serving among his, one of his many duties was serving as the accreditation manager for his organization. As an assessor for the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies, CALEA, Leon had an opportunity to meet with many organizations throughout the country. It was through performing assessments that he began to see the need to improve performance documentation. He told me that, he told me that one of the craziest things he ever found was that most agencies kept better documentation on their vehicles than they did their people. Our experience and our work with over 700 Guardian Tracking clients has taught us that the frustrations with performance evaluations isn't unique to any one organization. I'll turn it over to Leon now. Thanks, Mike. Um, kind of as a way of introducing today's topic, um, I just have a few questions for you to think about. Why do you evaluate? Do you like your evaluation tool? What do your employees say about evaluations? And how often do you evaluate? So let's talk about those for a minute. Why do you evaluate? I'm guessing a lot of you will respond with, we're required to. They're tied to promotions. You might, you might even say, I don't know why we do evaluations. The true purpose of evaluation should be to improve performance by learning from the past and setting goals for the future. To let employees know where they stand, in other words, where they excel and where they need improvement. And lastly, to mitigate liability, and that's both for the employer and for the, or the employee and for the organization. Do you like your evaluation tool? I know the answer to this one. I'm guessing that the majority of you are shaking your head no. Many of us, uh, I think, would argue that the evaluation tool is broken and that a new one is needed. We would argue that the evaluation process is broken and not the tool. What do, evalu what do your employees say about evaluations? You probably hear things like, our evaluations are worthless, they don't mean anything, and things like, um, I work my butt off and still have the same scores as those who do nothing. Well, guess what? They just might be right, and why? Because in many organizations, the high and the low performers are getting similar scores, scores that indicate that they are simply satisfactory or that they meet standards. How often do you evaluate? I mean, you might say once a year, twice a year, or quarterly, but it's not once a year. It's not two times a year. It's not quarterly. You evaluate every day. It's every time that you coach, counsel, mentor, or celebrate a positive contribution by one of your subordinates, you are evaluating performance. But that's simply not the way most of us look at it. Um, we see them as an event. We get notice that an evaluation is due, and there it is, that dreaded event. Think about you have, how you as a supervisor feel as the time to conduct performance appraisals approaches. I think if you're honest, most of us have one or more of the following feelings. Anxiety, nervousness, nausea, aggravation, frustration, confusion, stress, or dread. And you have to wonder, is it any different for the employee on the other side of the desk? Most likely it's those same feelings. We just might add fear to that list. 
do you agree that that's all wrong? When you get that notice, it should simply mean that the process you have been working on is coming to an end. It is simply time to fill out the official form. And you're going to use all of the data that's been collected all year long by you, other supervisors, and the employee, employee's peers. So why are we here today? It's certainly not to tell you how to fill out your performance appraisal. I'm sure all of you probably use different systems. It's not to tell you that you should be using Guardian Tracking. Granted, many of you use Guardian Tracking as a performance management system and we're honored by that. However, many of you today are not Guardian Tracking users and we want to assure you that the approach we advocate will work for you too. We're here today to talk about how you can take evaluations from an isolated annual event that is separate from all other supervisory responsibilities to a function that is integrated into your everyday supervisory responsibilities. In other words, we want you to make filling out that formal performance appraisal the final step of, an ongoing, of ongoing performance management. Now I'm going to let Paul take over to give you some tips on how to improve your evaluation process. Thank you, Liam. This is such a broad topic that we commonly discuss with different people as they're looking for mechanisms to help improve in this process. And it's something that's so common and we frequently discuss with new clients or potential clients and other people. But we really wanted to kind of bring it in and centralize it and, and bring it to you a little bit more formal, uh, additionally, while we're here. Now, as we discuss this topic and recognizing how broad it is, I really go back to uh, an assignment that I, uh, one of my favorite assignments in my career, and that was being involved with the field training program. Now, we have people from different types of organizations attending today, so I want to be kind of clear on what that is. That's that initial orientation process that you have when you come to a new company or an organization. And, and that first contact you have is a demonstration or an example of leadership that really starts to establish the culture within the organization and what your expectations are. So I want you guys to think back that when you first started, whether it was at the police department, communication center, or wherever you are, maybe in public safety, um, I'm going to be referring to that as the field training program or the FTO program, but keep in mind that does consider the, the CTO programs or other orientations that you go through. So it really lays the foundation for that introduction as a whole and establishes that process. So that's the reason why I refer back to that. And I think of it with three fundamentals. And the fundamentals that I think of when I look back at that process and I think about how important it is for that introduction for any new employee, but also others, are engaged leadership, healthy conversations, and transparent documentation. Now the reason it comes into play is because you, you concentrate on those issues when a person's first starting within a company or starting with a, in, in the public safety. And you really concentrated efforts in over, overseeing those things because it's such a complex profession. As you do that, you're doing it on a daily basis. It's an ongoing, it's an hourly basis. And then you consider, or you continuously allow for additional discretion. That person grows within that position. Well, this doesn't necessarily go away throughout their career. While they gain more experience and you give them more flexibility and they understand the parameters to make effective decisions, that continuous supervision diminishes, but it shouldn't stop. Um, in order to make those evaluations real and relevant, you have to remain engaged, have conversations, and have that documentation. So let's talk about engaged leadership. Engaged leadership is that sharing. Uh, it's engaged leadership is being committed to developing those future leaders in your organization when they first start all the way through their career. So again, you're engaging in the development of your future leaders, inspiring others to contribute to the core values and the goals within that organization organization. You do this by sharing your vision openly, setting expectations, but yet you also have a responsibility as a leader all throughout the organization to demonstrate those behaviors as well. It can't be do as I say, not as I do. It needs to be a part of who you are. In fact, um, there's an article by Eric Daigle that I would encourage you to read. We're going to share a link and you're going to have access to it too. But as you think about it being important throughout all of the organization, I want you to look at that article and consider 
the name of the article is called Your Department is Only as Strong as Your Weakest Supervisor. I would say that a disengaged or avoidant supervisor you can even call as a cancer to your organization. So consider the fact of when you choose to recognize, celebrate a correct behavior, that becomes a direct reflection of who you are as a leader. Not only that, but it directly impacts the culture within that organization as a whole. The same as that introduction when you first enter that organization and that first impression you have, that literally lays the foundation for where you're going to go from there. So again, you choose to recognize, celebrate, and correct. What you choose to celebrate, recognize, and correct is a direct reflection on you. So document the things that turn your head. If it causes you to take pause or take notice, it's a great opportunity to celebrate the contributions or making sure that you're correct in the behaviors you're looking for. Be a leader who strives to help all the members in your organization. Don't be a manager who only does what they have to do. Now, Waz has got a great story of, of somebody that we've come across during our time in, in working with this system that really does exemplify um, what it's like to be a disengaged leader and it's re avoiding responsibility. And Waz, if you don't mind, I'd really like it if you'd share that story. Sure. Um, it happened during a training session. Um, we were discussing the importance of consistent performance documentation throughout an organization. And this led to a further discussion emphasizing the need for upper management to lead by example, set clear expectations, and monitor the performance of downline supervisors. And I think it was that that, that kind of got this guy, he goes, he, uh, during that conversation, uh, he said, it was, it was a member of upper management, he said, I am not going to look to see what my supervisors are documenting, that's micromanagement. When you think about that, what, I mean, what, what is he saying? That manager's indifferent attitude is like saying, I don't want to know what's going on. He's, con he's content to let downline supervision operate as they see fit. And you, you have to wonder, what if each of his supervisors were to decide which policies their subordinates follow or ignore? Would that manager's response be the same? I mean, it, 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 makes, you, it makes you think. Um, you know, is checking or monitoring performance really micromanaging? Is it micromanagement to implement a process to improve or direct the organization? Is it micromanagement to train downline supervisors? Is it micromanagement to monitor progress? Is it micromanagement to mentor and counsel a downline supervisor? We would call that leadership. The point that Paul was making is not that it's not micromanagement to set high expectations for yourself and those who report to you. Consistent monitoring is critical with a new process. And, and granted, I think it, it becomes less important over time as that process is ingrained into the organizational culture. The danger of this type of indifference is that a leader's behavior really does flow down through all levels of the organization. If the if the goal is to promote a healthy culture, then management needs to be involved to the extent necessary to ensure that systems and processes are in place that will outlive personalities, survive management changes. I think it's about leaving a legacy. And engaged leadership demonstrates those behaviors that they look for. If that captain chooses to disengage, that becomes acceptable for the lieutenant, the sergeant, and then suddenly the entire organization is disengaged. again. You're only as strong as your weakest supervisor, and it becomes a cancer within the organization when it's identified as an accepted culture. So now I want to move on to the next topic or the next fundamental that we identified in this process. And I really want to talk about healthy conversations. Um, let's face it, recognizing, um, recognizing our recognition is an easy conversation to have. But don't underestimate the importance of saying thank you. Employees want and need feedback when topics are even uncomfortable. Uh, imagine coming to work. I want you guys to imagine coming to work on a normal day. You're walking in the office, you're engaging with other people, but you happen to notice each time you're talking to an individual, some level of awkwardness or uncomfortable between the two of you. It's normal people that you work with every day. 
it's not any surprise but it's people you're having conversation with but you also notice they happen to be paying particular attention to your face and other things you're accomplishing the things throughout the day that you wanted to and you're moving around but yet about lunchtime you walk into the bathroom and suddenly you look in the mirror there it is you have a bugger hanging from your nose now you gotta ask yourself why didn't any of those people I talked to earlier tell me it was there why did they let that compound and continue to embarrass me throughout the rest of the day for the other 20 people I had talked to the importance of that story and there's 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 a lady by the name of Sherry Harley that tells this and, and she's got a she's a consultant with uh, candid uh, cultures I just like the way she expresses that because it's a simple story, but it comes back with so many key points. The key points being, when I'm doing something wrong or something is obvious, I want to know at the time. I don't want to know later down the road. I want to know at the time. I don't want those issues to compound all throughout the course of the day. So give me the opportunity and give me the respect of being honest with me. Other people might equate that to a time they might have had their zipper open or other things. But awkward conversations are uncomfortable but they're not going to get any easier over time and to avoid them doesn't help the circumstances most conversations are not simple or are not this simple within our complex profession at all in public safety some key things I want you to keep in mind when you think about the healthy conversations that you need to have the ultimate goal is to make sure that you're improving performance it comes with a, it has to come with a clear message of what your expectations are and what an opportunity for success is to follow. Follow up these healthy conversations uh, to make sure there's no surprises with what you are planning to do after that conversation. If you're going to document it, your follow-up process is going to take place and other things that are going to occur. Um, I'm going to be talking about documentation even more later, but during this time when you're having that conversation, invite people to look at and review that of what you're going to document. One, you don't want any surprises, but the other thing you want ownership, you want to invite them to look at it and make sure that it accurately reflects that conversation. Again, no surprises and build trust. And then what you plan to do to follow up on that, I'll also discuss that more a little bit later. So let's talk about the time. The timing is important. You cannot avoid these conversations. It doesn't help to avoid it. It's not going to get any easier over time. Take the time to do it when the opportunity presents itself, contemporary to when the event occurs. And what I mean by contemporary to when the event occurs, that's when it has its most value, its most significance. They're going to remember from that point. Not only that, but again, you avoid them from compounding that situation down the road. You don't want it to continuously reoccur. Doing nothing is doing something. If that person slowly walks into roll call or comes into work five minutes late, you choose to ignore it, there's really no reason for it or other things. A couple days later the person chooses to do it again, all the other people around them are seeing this person regularly show up to work on time. Again, doing nothing is doing something. If you permit it, you're promoting it. Now all of a sudden other people start coming in work late to work as well. If it's accepted, they're going to do it as well. Eventually, you're the only one that's at work. So keep in mind, it is a good time to fix it. In fact, as soon as you know about it, and we all know this through case law and other things when it comes in the world of public safety, that once you know about it, you have an obligation to fix it. It's time for you to take steps so that this doesn't become an accepted practice within your organization. Avoidance or delay does come with a cost. And you want to give the opportunity for employees to improve that performance as well. They want to do a good job. The majority of people in our professions want to do quality work. They want to be there. They want to do the right thing. Bring it to their attention. Imagine the frustration you would feel sitting at the year-end review and suddenly learning something you'd done about six months earlier and how wrong it was. The first thing that starts to come to mind, what's going through your mind? Why did why didn't he tell me that earlier? Why am I just learning about this right now? How much are you really going to trust that person from that point forward? How long are they going to hold on to things and then suddenly lay it on your plate? Better yet, how inspired are you going to be to really support that supervisor and the organization when these things are held and kept secret until a later point in time to be brought out and presented to you? 
I do want to add, and I want to clarify um, something. Most of those are uncomfortable or awkward conversations. All of it has to do with conversations, and we have conversations with people every day in, in all areas uh, of different professions. But I want to clarify a point of healthy. What do I mean by that? Uh, the best healthy conversations I had in my career were the ones that I walked away wrong. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, I would enter a conversation with an employee knowing that I, I've got a perception of what I saw in a behavior or an action that I felt needed to be corrected. It wasn't within policy. It's something that some, I, expect, I expect something more with our goals and really where our vision is with our, with our unit or where we're at. Um, as I enter that conversation, I want to remain objective. I, I, think it's, I think it's very important to remain objective, but yet have a mission with a clear message, as I said earlier. But as I'm talking with that employee, suddenly I learn additional information that I didn't have before. And I get to walk away knowing I was wrong, but in a position to defend that employee. I may even be in a position to recognize them because the initiative or the problem-solving techniques that they applied to that, having more of the information that they considered. Again, it's a great opportunity to walk away from a healthy conversation knowing I was wrong. And now we can move forward with another message, but only because I took the time to actually have it. So in that process, I also discussed the last fundamental that I want to bring up, and that is, that is transparent documentation. The documentation, remember, I talked about um, when I go to document after a conversation. How I wanted them to make sure that they viewed it. I wanted that ownership, but I also want them to see it in a way to make sure that it accurately reflected our conversation. So let's talk about that as a whole. It's a vital part of any process is the documentation. And this is where most leaders actually struggle. Remember, performance that we choose to recognize, appreciate, and correct is a direct reflection of who we are as a leader, but also directly impacts all those employees that are, that are working with us, and it impacts the culture and the organization. Some important things to keep in mind, whether you're using guardian tracking or you're trying to utilize other means, Word documents, Excel, or other things, however it is you're choosing to do documentation, I want you to keep certain things in mind that I think are, that are very, very important in this process. It must be very simple. We all have many responsibilities throughout the job. Many of us wear a lot of hats within our organization. So we've got to make this easy. You've got to be able to provide the feedback and documentation. You need to make this transparent. How many of you want to have something documented about you that you can't see? And if the employee can't see it, how do you truly expect that to influence or improve their performance? If they don't know where they stand and they don't know what your expectations are, you're creating frustration and you're not really achieving what your mission was when it came to that documentation. You should always allow for opportunities for input. In the FTO program, we always had a section at the end of every day allowing an employee to provide feedback or opportunity of what they wanted to see or things they might have wanted to work on. But it gave them that opportunity and input that also brought in ownership. And it also opened up that, um, it broke down the walls of distrust. When they're able to see what's documented and they're, they're given the opportunity to provide input or feedback, I think that's important to do as well. You also need to make sure that for supervisors that are responsible for the individual, you've got to make sure that the right hand knows what the left hand's doing. You need to be on the same page. Inconsistent supervision, if one supervisor is making a decision and document it someplace else where the other one doesn't see it or know about it, and the other one steps in the next day and does the exact opposite, you create a frustration. Again, now you've got indecisive people out in the field in public safety that are not certain what direction to go. You're creating inconsistency, uncertainty. That leads to distrust. That leads to frustration for employees. They deserve better than that. You need to be on the same page. So make it so that supervisors can see the documentation and the steps that have been done. That way you know that you're on the same page. It needs to be centralized, and it also needs to be portable. There's a number of benefits from that. But by centralizing it in one location, again, you're solving a lot of that communication issue between different supervisors and other people, but then portable. Portable so that it can follow a person throughout their career. You don't end up with fragmented files in different places. Again, you're leading to the frustration for personnel, and you're leading to distrust if they think there's other things out there that they're not aware of. So make it centralized and make it portable as a person transitions from one area of the organization to another. And that can be important 
when it comes time to evaluations and who does the evaluation. I'll talk more about that in a minute. As a supervisor, you have two roles, reinforcing the positive and correcting the negative. Never underestimate the power of positive documentation when it comes to the documentation or feedback you're giving. Take the time to document and encourage. It promotes the values that you're wanting. Again, you're establishing the culture. Employees deserve to know where they stand. When supervisors are transparent and predictable, it does build trust and confidence with employees out in the field. You need that given the complexity of the profession. Correction is an opportunity given to employees to improve. Find a way to revisit these things. You cannot let correction or documentation hang. You need to follow through the cycle in that process. Uh, I think I look at it as building equity within employees. Um, as I address an issue or I correct behavior, I need to set a reminder to myself in some fashion to make sure that I revisit it and I give that employee credit for that improvement as a whole. This is an ongoing process. I shouldn't wait till the end of the year to say, well, did you fix it or not? I have a responsibility to follow up on that as well. For GT users, this is simply done by creating an action item. And it does remind you, but it also shows up line that you plan on revisiting. It also shows the action items or the steps that you may follow, reviewing material, reviewing policy and other documentation but then you truly give them the credit when they've improved that behavior as well. I think that helps contribute to mitigating any liability in the future uh, for both the employee but the organization. Imagine being more prepared to defend yourself but in defending the organization, also defending your employees. When it comes time for those depositions and you're being asked about that personnel file, that corrective action and other things that are sitting there, but yet they're left unattended. There's no additional follow-up documentation to show where they've improved and other things. I think it's imperative that you as a supervisor and as a leader, you follow up on that and you truly give credit. So I just think it's important to think about. So for those that are not GT users, think about your phone, think about Outlook, think about little other options. Don't make it a post-it note that's going to fall off your computer you're going to forget about. Find a way to make sure that you're reminding yourself. And it, it, it really depends on the type of behavior that justifies when that action is going to be taken. So you set that action item based upon when you think that's going to be effective, but don't let that hang. So now I want to go into the evaluation portion of this. Hey, hey, Paul, if I can interrupt, I'd like to tell a quick story that kind of illustrates the point you just made. Now please do, Mike. Go ahead. A couple years back, I had a conversation with a deputy chief about a problem employee. We'll call her Marsha. Marsha was a marginal employee. Uh, over the years, she had had many conversations with supervision about her performance. On each occasion, her supervisors had discussed the problem issues and ways for her to improve. Each time, Marsha pledged to do better, but ultimately failed. The supervisors were engaged in the process and having the needed conversations, but they weren't getting the, desi the desired results. There was no transparency. There was no way of giving Marsha the timely, relevant feedback she needed regarding her performance. It was only after the organization implemented a system to make feedback transparent that Marsha began to self-reflect on her performance. Even though it was accurate, she didn't like the picture that was being painted about her. She began to see how she was perceived by others, and she began to change. She's since become a very productive member of the team. Back to you, Paul. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I think that, that really does affirm the whole process is important. It's an excellent example where supervisors were engaged. They were having those healthy conversations with her, but it really wasn't until the documentation became obvious and evident that she's identifying that pattern. It's an excellent example where transparent documentation is going to allow them to see it. In a lot of cases, organizations put those in files and other places, it's easily forgotten. But if you can put it in a place where it's transparent and the employee gets to see it, that pattern does become evident to them. It's putting pieces of the puzzle together. Appreciate you sharing that, Mike. The, um, the next step of the process that we want to talk about is now when you get to that dreaded event that Waz talked about earlier, uh, and it's the evaluation. And the process is based on a solid fundamentals and providing contemporary feedback. Remember, it's important. At the time of the event, it's an ongoing process. Contemporary to when things happen and they have their most value. If that occurs throughout the year, the evaluation actually just becomes a byproduct of that process. So you're truly making that event much more simple because all the other things have occurred up to this point. You've had active, engaged leadership, healthy conversations, and that transparent documentation. 
now you get to the point where supervisors and employees are actually on the same page. You're providing the feedback. It is truly valued so much more because it's recognized at the time of the events. So when you walk in there, both sides of the desk come to that meeting with their eyes wide open. You're reducing your anxiety and the fear that we talked about earlier. You're eliminating a lot of those issues just because they can see things. You're increasing trust because there's no surprises. But as you do that also, you need to consider multiple sources. You can't look at that evaluation just from one person's perspective. Give scores based upon a total body of work. Um, the only way that happens is by considering all those different resources and looking at it in a perspective that you can give and you can justify those high scores and low scores. What we've got on the screen right now is kind of an example of that culmination of events. All three of those fundamentals where you're able to get a hold of that, but because this information is given, and you'll notice in here that you actually do see multiple sources. You see a variety of different categories. This is how you avoid from having those halo horns effects. This is how you avoid from having that one major incident where a point may have made a mistake in it, influence and control your entire evaluation. Instead, it should be documented because you followed up on it when they've corrected that behavior. You should be able to support those high scores and those low scores because of the fact-based documentation from all these different people. Now, all of a sudden, those evaluations truly become real and relevant to help you benefit many other processes in your organization, such as your promotion process, the evaluation process, the ways in which you're going to utilize those resources to help the overall goals of the organization when you can see and reflect on what their strengths are and their weaknesses. It's really an opportunity then, too, when you have a tool that gets it centralized in that way. It's an opportunity now to look forward. Um, I brought up earlier about supervisors. They're, they're, often there's a debate over who's going to do an evaluation on somebody. Um, as a person transfers from one area of the organization to another, and that's why it's important to be portable as well. If I were to get, a, if I were going to get a new employee assigned to me right at the end of an evaluation period, I'd like to think that as a leader, I wanted to embrace that opportunity. It's a great opportunity for me, really, to to utilize the documentation that exists when this is consistently done throughout an organization, to give them their high and low scores. But now I get to focus on what our goals and objectives or their improvement plans are. And moving forward, it's going to be my responsibility to follow up on that process. So I wanted to engage there, and I wanted to know what we were going to focus on during that period of time. And that's where we really get into the goals and objectives and the meat and potatoes of an evaluation. What's the purpose for it? Not only to recognize and identify where, it will, where we've come from, but what are we going to do to move forward with those goals and objectives and where you fit in the organization. So in doing this, remember that this is an ongoing process, whether it's goals and objectives or employee improvement plans. Engaged leadership, healthy conversations, and transparent documentation has to be a part of that as well. I also recommend that you find a way to keep these alive, real, and relevant. Find mechanisms to remind yourself to review this document or review the goals and objectives frequently, updating those progresses so that you continue on that path toward success. Uh, one way of doing this is setting action items. You want to set those action items, remind you to, re to review that. Whether you choose that it's a supervisor that gives that documentation or if you want the employee. One thing I like to do in pack reviews, directed patrol projects, things of that nature, I like to set action items for the employees themselves. And when you're doing that, it gives them a wonderful opportunity to brag about what they accomplished or explain what they didn't. It becomes their own words through that process, but it also keeps it in front of them. And there's some level of ownership and accountability to themselves as well. So again, give them an opportunity to brag about what they accomplished or explain what they didn't. Now, whether you want supervisors to do that or employees to do that, that's up to you to decide. But I encourage you to consider that in order to overall accomplish those goals and keep them real and relevant. Now, Mike has another story that we, we talked about a lot as we were looking at this, this very broad topic as a whole. And I think this story kind of culminates the process itself and why these three fundamentals are so important. So, I, Mike, I'd like, to, I'd like for you to, to share uh, what the story from the captain from Dothan, I believe, is where it's from. So if you would, would you mind sharing that, please? Sure. Um, this came from actually came from Lieutenant Roy Woodham at the Dothan Police Department. Uh, Dothan's been a client for several years. Uh, 
Roy told me about preparing for evaluations, and he echoed some of the same things that Leon said earlier about this being a time of frustration, dread, and so on. That isn't the case anymore. Roy now has all the information needed to make informed, relevant decisions about the employee's performance, and it's easily retrievable. More importantly, because of the transparency, the employees being evaluated know exactly what to expect. Roy told me about the first time he evaluated an employee who had come to his agency after working several years at another. After the interview, the employee said, I want you to know something. This is the first time in 10 years that I came into an evaluation knowing exactly what to expect. I had already heard or seen everything we talked about. There were no surprises. How do you think that happened? It was the process that made it possible. The evaluation simply became an extension of that process. I'm going to turn things back over to Leon now, who will bring everything home for us. Um, in conclusion, I think I'd ask you to consider um, the following takeaways. Evaluations are not an event, they're an ongoing process. You need to define clear expectations and lead by example. You need to implement a consistent management style and allow transparency throughout all levels of your organization. You need to manage problems and provide, provide feedback immediately. Don't wait until evaluation time. This will eliminate surprises and allow for a proactive approach to performance management. You need to celebrate success. If, if, if you take the time to promote a positive organizational culture, you will bring out the best performance of your employees. Your documentation needs to be fact-based. Goals and, goals and objectives or performance improvement plans are also processes that need to be managed. Don't fail your organization and your people by setting and forgetting. Consistent, transparent documentation contemporary to an event builds trust. Understand that proper and transparent documentation improves the overall culture of an organization. Creating a culture of proper documentation is a leadership issue, and it's not easy. It takes skill and practice. It's a process that takes time and commitment. The benefits, however, are significant and are well worth that time and effort. When do you document? We like to say when it turns your head. When you observe a behavior and you're thinking, that's exactly what we're looking for, it is probably worth celebrating and documenting. If you're thinking, that's not right, that's not acceptable, don't put it off. Have that difficult conversation Paul mentioned and document that conversation. And finally, organizationally, you need to monitor the documentation created by subordinate supervisors to ensure that the organizational expectations are being achieved and documented. I think what we've learned over our 80 years of collective law enforcement experience and the many wonderful relationships we have built over the nine years with Guardian Tracking is that proper documentation contemporary to an event that is shared with the employee is powerful. It's true leadership. We would invite you to accept this challenge. Have the courage to embrace excellence, fight mediocrity, say no to the status quo, and strive for a culture where excellence is recognized, rewarded, and becomes the norm. As leaders, you need to be committed to developing the men and women you serve as the future leaders of your organization. And finally, as Simon Sinek put it, if you get the environment right, every single one of your people have the capacity to do remarkable things. Thanks, Leon. I'm going to bring in Ben Wazalewski, who's been fielding questions for us. Ben's going to relay a few questions and then wrap things up. Ben? Thanks, Mike. Hello, everybody. Like Mike said, time allows for just a few questions to wrap things up today. There were a lot of great questions, and we will be replying to all those via email. Also, if any questions come about after the webinar today, we encourage you to reach out to one of our team members. All right, so our first question, we're going to direct it towards Leon. Leon, I'm an upline supervisor. How do I get my downline supervisors to be engaged with these discussions and documentation? 
that's actually a, a question we get a lot. Um, and, and the way I would answer that is, I mean, if you're an upline, upline supervisor, um, a CEO, doesn't matter. I mean, the first question that I would ask, have you set the expectations and shared those expectations? I mean, do your supervisors know what you expect in the way of documentation? And if you've set those ex expectations about what you expect about those interactions and that, I mean, a lot of times we say that's part of leadership is developing the people around us. Um, um, are you as the CEO or the upline manager, are you leading by example? In other words, are you documenting those things when they come to your attention, um, that positive documentation, celebrating those successes, having those difficult conversations and documenting those negative behaviors? Um, and are you paying attention? I mean, we talk all the time. You hear a supervisor in the hallway talking about how busy it was the night before and what a great job certain people did. Well, ask the question, did you, did you tell them they did a great job and did you document that so you have that when you need it? And then critical to all of this, I think, is, is are you looking at their patterns of documentation? We know from what we've done for the last nine years is that documentation should be about nine to one positive to negative. You're painting, if you're painting a true picture of your organization, your people are out there doing great work most of the time, the documentation pattern should reflect that. So what you have to do is you have to have a way of looking at each individual supervisor and determining what their documentation pattern is. You might have a supervisor who only documents negative behaviors. He's that old time supervisor that says if you're doing something right, you're just doing your job. You might have a supervisor who is a feel-good supervisor who avoids those conversations that Paul was talking about and only documents positives. And you might have a supervisor that doesn't document at all. But the time to find that out is not when you need documentation. It's to pay attention all the time. What are they documenting? If they're not documenting to the expectations you've set, then that's a time that you're going to coach and counsel and mentor those supervisors until you create that culture agency-wide or organizationally that we talked about earlier. So I think that's the way I would answer that question. Okay, thanks, Leon. We have another question. Mike, this one's directed to you. I'm a little confused. It sounds like I'm going to be spending a lot of time documenting. Is that true? Uh, a great question. I, I, I guess the way I'd answer it, I guess at the end of the day, we're not asking, we're just bringing up that, that we're making a point of saying these are some things you should be doing if you're not already doing. Uh, let me answer that this way. I, uh, when I became a young supervisor and uh, I started looking through files because I wanted to know the people that I served with from, from a documentation standpoint, what struck me immediately was almost everything in there was negative. And I thought to myself, how? You know, my the personnel that, that that report to me are doing a lot. They're doing a lot of good work out there. And how in the world can I defend them when the only thing we're documenting are the negative things? It, it seems like we we tend to be we tend to be very good at documenting those negative things that come to our attention. Those turn your head moments that Leon mentioned earlier. It's the positive that often gets overlooked. I wanted to be in a position that to not only to defend my personnel decisions, to avoid, to mitigate liability, but to defend my personnel when the need arise. Uh, the ultimate goal should be painting an accurate picture of who your employees are, not just the negative or the or the occasional correction that's made, but painting that overall picture. Um, a few years ago, we uh, I uh, I had an occasion to talk with a young officer from uh, from one of our client agencies. This young man, all he had ever known was Guardian Tracking. When I asked him what he thought about it, I knew the chief loved the software, but I wanted to know what he thought about it. And his answer was, Guardian Tracking's, Guardian Tracking's me. That's who I am. That's exactly what our goal's always been, to be to change that perception of what documentation means. The good, the bad, everything, painting an accurate picture of who that employee is. and. And it doesn't need to take a lot of time. It just needs to be consistent and relevant to what the employee is doing. I hope that helps. Thanks, Mike. Great, great explanation. Um, Paul, let's let's give this last one to you. This question was, 
Our problem is everybody seems to get average evaluations. How do we change that? Oh. Well, first of all, I want to add a little bit to Mike's. Um, one thing that you in addition to that, don't make it hard. Keep it simple. A lot of people tend to to elaborate and do a lot of different things with documentation when it comes to quick, easy, brief notes about recognition and other things. Keep it very, very simple. Get rid of the garbage. Make it simple. And when you do that, and everybody, all the supervisors are doing it, and you're encouraging documentation from even peers and other people, you'll get that documentation you need, just as a, as a side note to Mike's. Uh, additionally to that, now your question, as far as everybody gets an average score, um, and how do we correct that? In most cases, you're back to the process. You're back to the fundamentals of that process. But I think the thing that makes that most relevant is that this can't stop at just frontline supervisors. Having engaged upline supervision, chiefs, deputy chiefs, other people, or, or upper level management being engaged in that process, you have the responsibility of developing those frontline supervisors as well. So if it breaks down at that step, you're going to have the inconsistency. You're going to have average scores because you're not going to have the supporting documentation. Keep in mind, this needs to be a part of the culture of which you demonstrate as a leader in your organization, and it has to be at all levels in your organization. It can't be just at the front line. So I think that's the best way to get that because if you do that right and the process is followed, you're going to have those fact-based documentation to support high and low scores, and it is going to differentiate who you're going to have in the organization and help you with those promotion processes and other considerations that it gives you. So keep that in mind. Fix the model. Paul, Paul, I'll add one thing to what you just said. If, 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 if an organization's evaluations are all middle of the road because we don't, we don't have that documentation collected to support giving them a high, a high or low score, we're doing a disservice to the employee and we're doing a disservice to the organization. If you end up having to take disciplinary action against an employee and you, the evaluations all say that this employee met standards, met standards, met standards, puts you in a difficult position to defend that defend that disciplinary action. And conversely, if you need to support that high-performing employee who has been wrongly accused, you need to be in a position to say, hey, look at all the things that this employee has done. So it, I, mean, I think it is, it's critical and it all gets back to the documentation. Okay, Thank, thanks to both of you. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for questions today. Again, we will be emailing responses to all the questions that we did not get to. Also, everyone will receive an email with the webinar recording, any supporting documents or link that we mentioned to today, and then any contact information if you have any questions or comments. Finally, I want to thank everybody for joining our webinar. We hope that you found it beneficial and that you can take this information and remove that stress from the evaluation process. From everybody here at Guardian Tracking, we hope you have a wonderful and safe day.